Welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining me. And we've got a very interesting show for you today. We're going to be talking about refugees. We're going to be talking about refugees in Ukraine, which led to a conversation that our guest had with the former South Korean ambassador to Ukraine, Lee Yang-gu, about South Korea and the impending crisis that could take place there with North Korea. Very interesting topic. And my guest today is Emily Schroen, who is a global nonprofit development specialist with a focus on humanitarian aid, education, and international relations. She has worked with refugees and displaced people in the U.S., Spain, and Poland, and recently returned from a humanitarian aid mission in Ukraine with Americans for Ukraine, a U.S.-based nonprofit supporting refugees in Poland. Emily, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat about the recent work. And you're also a Young Voices contributor. I should not neglect to mention our friends over there. I don't know where, I don't know where to start because I know I want to ask a lot of questions about Ukraine and the refugee situation, but you're here to talk about North Korea. So I for, forgive me if listener and Emily, if we start with Ukraine and accidentally end up with North Korea second. But tell me a little bit about your background. How did you end up as a settlement resettlement specialist? What exactly are you doing in Ukraine? You, you told me you're in Hawaii right now, but you're about to go back to Poland. Sure. Yeah, it hasn't been a linear journey. That's for sure. It's a lot of spontaneous opportunities that led me to do what I'm doing today. I started in Washington, D.C. I was doing educational programming, working with undergraduate students, doing things of that nature. And then I ended up actually attending an event where a refugee center director in was based in Poland was speaking. Found that really fascinating, as you can probably tell from my participation with the Young Voices program. I'm interested in developing as a writer. And I thought, what an interesting story. This person who is now one of the largest refugee center directors in the world in the span of just a few months went from just being a normal Polish citizen doing some media production work to all of a sudden jumping into the humanitarian aid sphere in a super big way. So I sat down with him, did, a, did quite a long interview, learned more about the project and saw how expansive the needs were and where I might be able to help. So after a few conversations, I ended up joining his team out of America and we've been doing things like awareness events, projects in the Modlinska Humanitarian Aid Center in Warsaw, various other things. And then I was fortunate to help organize fundraise for and actually execute a project, what we called a hotspot center in, in Ukraine, where Ukrainians can go for education materials. It's also a physical shelter, providing a, a space for people to charge their phones, have reliable heating, especially electricity, things like that. So that's kind of the nature of my involvement. And now as we're headed into the second year of the full-scale Russian invasion, I'm going to be in and out of Poland more frequently, helping helping with projects there in the center, and then also extending things that we call our satellite programs into Ukraine. So that's where I've been. And then I've also served refugees with various nonprofits here in the U.S., but mostly from African countries or Asian countries, all over the place. So this is a bit new territory for me, but it's definitely a crash course. <laughs> yeah, it has been for everybody. I've I've had I've talked about this on the show, but my in-laws adopted four Ukrainian orphans. They came over, stayed mm. a couple summers, a Christmas. They've become part of the family. And like day four of the invasion, I'm like, uh, we got to get them out of there. And everybody's like, you're overreacting. I'm like, we got to get them out of there. They're bombing orphanages. No, they're yeah. not. Here's where they're bombing orphanages. Okay, let's start working on this. And then they started beating up on the director. Now that their former orphanage in Odessa was bombed and completely mm. destroyed. And they ended up in Poland in like a hotel that has just let them stay for a very long time. And the kids were told, oh, just pack for the weekend. And they're like, yeah, we're going, we're afraid we're going for the weekend to Poland. And I'm like, mm, okay. Really take what you oh want. My God. And they're one of millions. Maybe you can tell me the official number of refugees that have left Ukraine for Poland and settled in just Poland alone. Do you know? 
Yeah, it's difficult to say because there's a lot of different statistics and numbers, right? If we're talking about the terms of people who have left Ukraine, we're looking at around 15 million. Many of those have returned to Ukraine or bouncing back and forth or have fled through other countries like Romania. In terms of people who have crossed the Ukrainian border into Poland, we're looking at closer to 9.5 upwards of million people who have crossed into Poland. In Warsaw alone, which is where the refugee center I'm fortunate to work with is located, they, Warsaw used to have a population of around 2 million people, and now it has a population of around 3 million people. So that, just that one city yeah. increased in size by about a third. So it's, Which Poland's it's, population was listed at 37 million. Ukraine was 43 million. So yeah, to have 10 million, 15 million come in is a real hardship. And I don't, I've not understood how the Polish government can sustain this in terms of bringing in all these refugees and paying the orphanage to take Kate. Like we, we tried to bring them here multiple times over the last year. We just got denied again, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian government not letting us adopt them. We don't get it. But yeah. how is Poland coping with this addition of people? H has it just absorbed and it was a trauma to begin with, or is it still just very difficult for Poland? Oh, it's definitely an ongoing problem and it's going to continue being a problem. The good news is that it's not just Ukrainians crossing the border into Poland and all of them want to stay in Poland and are just there in Poland. Many of them, in fact, the center I work with has helped relocate about 37,000 Ukrainians in program, relocation programs around the world, Asia, Canada, United States, Europe all around. And some people see better opportunities there. However, you're right. It's been a challenge and many people have been really impressed and surprised by the Polish response and how they've been able to accommodate people. One of the ways they're doing that is through humanitarian aid centers. And then also there's a program I believe called like the 40 plus program where the Polish government is providing a limited amount of support for Polish citizens to house Ukrainians in their homes for the first 120 days is how much is how much the government is providing time and support for Ukrainians to stay. However, there are some changes that are being made to these laws. The Polish government is worried that Ukrainians need to become more active in order to reduce the financial burden in Poland so that the amount of support is being reduced. The amount of time Ukrainians are allowed to stay in Poland without working or sending their kids to Polish schools is reducing as well. So yeah, that financial burden is real and present. And then there's also, of course, issues with Poland and the European Union that are complicating funding into Poland specifically. That's issues with the Supreme Court and so on and so forth. For instance, the Modlinska Humanitarian Aid Center is no longer government funded. It had to transition to a completely private funding base. They do get some support from the government in terms of that 40 plus program that I meant to, mentioned, but it's not receiving substantial support. And that's why American organizations and this movement of Americans for Ukraine was started to help these people help Ukrainians. Tell me about the organization. How did it get started and what do you do with it? Sure. So Americans for Ukraine is a American-based nonprofit that was co-founded by one of the directors of the Modlinska Humanitarian Aid Center, Krzysztof Szczesny, and also a few other American nonprofit consultants, including John Savage, Mark Tennant. They came together and said, we need to find a way to support Poland and specifically the center in Poland as their made a commitment, despite losing government funding, despite all these barriers, to continue serving Ukrainian refugees to the best of their ability. And even past 120 days, if that was, if that's deemed necessary. They started this organization to help direct American donors, American expertise, things like how do we engage professionals to create logistic methods, uh, using Western information and knowledge to the countries that have already done this and other both in, internally and then in other conflicts. How do we import that knowledge to the refugee center, creating better systems? For instance, currently we're currently working on creating a refugee app where people who want to come to the shelter can download this app, know where everything is located, 
find opportunities, learn more about relocation programs, find relatives, perhaps, things like that. It's a combination of goals. One is the financial support. The other is the expertise, support like that, developing this global network, and then ultimately coming around and supporting this center. We're also working on a more global brand that's going to expand our efforts into things like working with relocation projects in Japan and Korea. So when the polls go into Korea to work on a relocation project. They don't have to say, we're with Americans for Ukraine. So the organization is actively evolving. And my role right now is catch all everything person. It's a small yeah. organization. At, at work, so we call I you the crumb tray. We have the crumb tray. Sure. Where she, yeah, she's very a vital person, but you know, I, I don't know who's going to do that. Give it to Grace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. But when it comes down to it, when I met Krzysztof particularly, he was doing a lot of things that weren't a, the most economical use of his time. So for me to be able to take things and help him writing documents in English, or even something as simple as scheduling things. So I do some things like writing important proposals and also just scheduling meetings and trying to open up some opportunities for him to keep doing the important work that he's doing. But yeah, that's so, kind of what I've been up to. So give me some personal stories that maybe you've seen from folks who are coming in from Ukraine. Give a sense mm -hmm. of what's happening there because I think, especially in the libertarian world, you're caught between very pro-Ukrainian, very pro-Russian, and I don't know what to believe in the middle. And you don't, nobody wants to trust CNN, but you sure don't want to trust RT or, or any of that right. stuff. What, what do you hear from refugees about what's happening in Ukraine on the ground? It's interesting. And I've been fortunate to conduct interviews with and to speak with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds who can provide some insight on this, both refugees, humanitarian aid workers, and then also some people who are operating in Ukraine who say the media is not capturing the full picture and sometimes some of the things are just wrong. But in terms of refugees, it's kind of a wide spectrum. In, in our center, we see all kinds of people, good people, bad people, usually don't see as very rich people because they come and they can do their own accommodations and all those things. But we've seen, gosh, women who have been the victims of just the most tragic sexual violence that I think we've ever heard of. I didn't know it was possible for someone to be sexually assaulted 60 times. That type of thing we see. And is that from the, the Russian soldiers? Is that from just population right. gone anarchic or what? Russian soldiers in that particular case, but of course, you know, there's been an, also an issue with police force in, in Ukraine. Obviously their efforts are divided. So right. it, what it comes down to isn't are Ukrainians good or bad, it's Ukrainians are people and there are criminals and then there are also good, honest people. And we've seen a lot of victims. I spoke to one woman, I did an interview with one Ukrainian woman who was, um, who came to the shelter with her son and her mother. Her mother was, gosh, almost 90 years old and her son was a teenager. Both had pretty severe disabilities. And she said she was worried that they had, that her son was sick because they had been forced to drink contaminated water that had human bodies in it. It's, you don't see this kind of thing on the news, both both the sides of Ukraine that are still functioning. There's still nightclubs operating, even though they have to close at 10 or 11 or whenever cur curfew is. And then there's also parts of Ukraine, like in Mariupol, that are completely leveled, almost completely destroyed. In the media, I think, sometimes paints a picture of Ukraine as entirely just this giant war front, which isn't entirely true. But then there's also... If you walk down the streets in Kyiv, you might not immediately notice some signs of damage, but you are, there is a risk. So yeah, what, and some of these refugees were starting to see more acute hunger needs of places where aid isn't quite reaching. There's some people who walk three plus days just to get across the border into Poland without food, without resources. And for some of them, like the food that they receive at the center on that first day is the first thing they've eaten in quite a long time. Women, children, men, men, according to rules in Ukraine, if they're within a certain age, need to stay in the country to be unreserved for fighting and such. However, 
many there's many exceptions including the number of children you have if your family has disabilities or some also at the beginning fled through various other countries including even russia to get down to poland and other places so it's a mix of people and it's a mix of problems yeah. yeah, I hadn't really thought of that. Is it has it settled after a year? If you were in Paris in World War II, you could live a decent life. But if you were on the front lines, then it there was different stories. Ha, has it settled where the Donbass region is just an open active war zone, but then the rest of the country people have returned from Poland back to some of those places, like Lviv, which is mm -hmm. closer to Poland, and Kiev? Is that What's happened? I'm surprised nightclubs are open because, yeah, in my mind, the whole country's on fire. They're being bombed every minute. It's a huge crisis all across the country. But maybe I, I just have a complete different perception based on thanks to American right. Western media. And I can't say I blame you and many other people who have that perception because I think that's the image that we're being given. But and the truth is, it's a large country and there's a lot of different things going on. I know one thing or one area I can speak to more particularly is Ternopil, Ukraine, which is a bit more Western. It's on top some strategic underground piping and things that actually, I believe, and I could be wrong, but channeling some kind of Western or Russian resources into other countries. I'm not sure, but for various reasons, it's been largely untouched. There have been, I think, maybe three missile strikes in Ternopil specifically since the start of the conflict. So that's where a lot of IDPs are concentrating in that kind of middle western part of Ukraine. That's where I was able to go just a few months ago to help set up the Ternopil Center. But for these people, it's as usual in a way. Of course, they have big humanitarian aid centers. They're seeing a lot of the same stories some that I shared with you about IDPs or internally displaced people coming from really damaged parts of Eastern Ukraine. However, like you mentioned, a lot of people have returned from Poland or elsewhere back to Ukraine for various reasons. Um, some are saying maybe their city was recently liberated and they say, well, I'm going to go back. And that's great. And, and if from a hopeful perspective, However, sometimes those cities are retaken or the infrastructure. Or is if you so remember heavy. Syria, yeah, the, the pictures out of Ukraine look like Syria. If you remember the Syrian conflict, yeah. where it was just the entire eastern part of the country, there wasn't any services. There wasn't water. There wasn't toilets. There wasn't apartments. Yeah, yeah. that that eastern part looks a lot like Syria now in, in some of these cities. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I would totally be the same way. I want to get back to my home. But it'd be heartbreaking yeah. to get back and just your home not be recognizable. But then for some people, this is the new normal that they've ado adapted to. And you hear missile sirens three times a week, sometimes more, depending on where you are. And you live your life. And that's the way it is. And like I spoke with a, a nonprofit coordinator, a U.S.-based nonprofit coordinator over in Kiev, who was saying, I tell people if they really want to understand what's going on here, they have to see it for themselves. Because if you were to walk down some streets in Ukraine, you would have no idea there's a war going on. And then, of course, other streets no longer exist. It's more complicated, obviously, as most things are, than the media portrays it as. But there's definitely still an ongoing active suffering and a huge need over there. So... You wrote an article, which is what you're here to talk about. Thank you for indulging me in these questions because I find it fascinating. You wrote it in the diplomat.com back in February. South Korea should be taking notes on Ukraine. Where did the idea for this article come from and what is it about? Sure. So the idea actually came from my experience working with and meeting people in Poland. Actually, one of the refugee center directors who I've mentioned previously was telling me a story about various people who come visit the center. They've had visits from a lot of major ambassadors to Poland, things like that. But he mentioned to me specifically that the South Korean, the South Korean group stood out to him because the types of questions that they were asking were much more specific, much more detailed, much more logistical. Like, how do you do these particular things to accommodate this vast swath of people? And Eventually, after talking, he learned more from them about how South Korea is interested in logistically how to handle this number, this large number of people in case they see a, a large number of refugees from North Korea. And when he told me this, I was fascinated because 
this isn't a story that you hear about frequently. Of course, South Korea pops up in the news because of whatever recent thing Kim Jong-un said regarding missile arsenals and things like that. But I think because of the overarching just regime secrecy and repressiveness, we forget about the bubbling humanitarian crisis that is is in North Korea right now. And so that was the basis of my article, the premise of saying South Korea has shown interest in these humanitarian aid centers. And I've also spoken with, for example, who you referenced, the former South Korean ambassador to Ukraine, about, about them acknowledging this Polish response, noticing the similarities between Poland and Ukraine, maybe South and North Korea, although there are many differences. There are things that can be learned about how a modern country, a Western country, can create institutions to accommodate people and how to do this better and not rewrite the book every single time we have a crisis like this. Yeah, and speaking with these people in South Korea, their history and the their experience with refugees was similar to how Poland's was not too long ago. They don't suffer from earthquakes or tsunamis or things like that. that Poland had a major flood maybe 25 years ago, but they had didn't have the tools and equipment to accommodate the millions of refugees that flooded across their border. And if perhaps when North Korea opens up whether it's by a war or some regime change or tragedy or whatever, South Korea could see itself in a similar position. And it's probably not in a position to be ready for that. Yeah, some of the similarities that you mentioned in the article were interesting. Similar cultures, similar pieces, but South Korea is what we're, I don't know if you want to talk about it or want to address it, but you look at how Poland treated the Syrian refugees that are on their border with Belarus and mm -hmm. how they've treated Ukrainian refugees, there's a clear difference. The Polish government has largely run on anti-refugee sentiment until the Ukrainian, and apparently that's very similar to South Korea. They don't have a very good resettlement rate. Do you think that they would rise to the challenge if North Korea were to collapse at some point? It's hard for me to say, but what I can say is that the people I've been fortunate to speak to, another person I quoted in my article, Daniel, had is working with some of these nonprofits and organizations that are supporting refugees from other countries and as well as identifying needs of refugees from North Korea that are in South Korea right now. And like you mentioned, honestly, both countries, Poland and South Korea have had their issues with refugee populations. And there is the benefit of having refugees from a country that's more similar to yours or for South Koreans accepting other Koreans and for Poles accepting Ukrainians who are their close neighbor, similar language and historical background in the sense of the perhaps the hurdle of discrimination or the hurdle of such things is a little bit easier to jump over. Does that make it right to discriminate against refugees from other populations? Absolutely not but it does maybe create a better, more realistic outlook for South Korea accepting North Korean refugees. Of course, right now there's big issues with discrimination and there's big issues with institutions and things like that that are ready to accept North Korean refugees. However, the way we've seen the inter international community, even Joe Biden's recent trip to Warsaw not too long ago, of people acknowledging and applauding the Polish response and their willingness to accept all these Ukrainian refugees, I think, or I hope, that South Korea has noticed that. And I think that if they were to need to accept all these North Korean refugees, that the international community would acknowledge, applaud, and probably support that. Of course, if there, again, there's another challenge of perhaps a flood of North Korean refugees into South Korea doesn't necessarily mean unification either, which is another kind of complicating idea regarding the Korean peninsula is it's South Korea has a policy of one Korea. Koreans are Koreans. So it would all, a lot of it would have to depend on the exact nature of the crisis that create these refugees. But I do think, and I am hopeful that it would, that South Korea could have a effective reception of a large number of refugees, but they need to be thinking ahead now of how they would handle that. So I always recommend this book when talking about North Korea. It's an excellent book. It's called Nothing to Envy by Bar Barbara Demick.
And in it, it talks about the 1990s famine and basically Kim Jong Il, the Kim Jong Un's father, mm-hmm, was purposely starving sections of the country to keep food in Pyongyang. And in those areas, like the bark was stripped off of the trees because it almost looked like a World War One battlefield in some of these areas because everything had been eaten because the famine was so bad and millions starved to death. And mm-hmm. I've not seen, I'm a fairly news literate person and I have not seen much about that. Maybe little rumblings and headline here or there, but in your article, you say that the humanitarian crisis in North Korea is reaching 1990s levels. Can you give us more information on that? And there's been several articles published, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, about how this current famine, this current hunger crisis, which has been caused both by or exacerbated by sanctions, also internal restrictions related to COVID-19, that the current hunger crisis or famine could be actually worse than it was during that period. And our imaginations, based on kind of some of those visuals you just described, can only imagine what's going on right now. Yeah, it's true that the country isn't receptive to receiving foreign aid. It's not. It hasn't been receptive to uh, imports and exports and things like that. And then also facing sanctions. It's and with the military buildup, it isn't prioritizing this these issues. But I think one thing that is that really stood out to me in my conversation with the ambassador that I wrote about is he said that if North Korea were to open up in terms of having refugees visibility in the country, which is impossible under the current regime, that could happen tomorrow. It, it, we could be looking into one of the worst humanitarian crises in decades. And right now, there's not a lot of talk about it, which is understandable because there are a lot of other humanitarian aid crises just in these past couple of months competing for our attention, competing for international attention. Why should we be looking at a country that we have to, that is so hard to see these humanitarian crises because of a lack of transparency, a lack of international visuals or media? Why should we be looking for that when there are people suffering very acutely that are just easier to identify. Yeah, it was actually Kim Jong-il who finally admitted that there was a crisis and Americans dropped food and the Chinese dropped food in the fields, much like in World Mm -hmm. War II, and helped kind of ease the crisis. But it got bad enough that he admitted some weakness. And I don't know about Kim Jong-un if he would do that. I know he's grooming his daughter possibly to take over, but there is instability, not just this internal instability that they've seemed to have the, the... Kim's have immunized themselves from, but they're possibly losing support from Russia, their secondary benefactor, and maybe even China. As you cite in your article, Kim Jong-un keeps firing rockets at inopportune times that embarrass the Chinese, and he really can't afford to lose the Chinese support. (laughs) It's It could be very bad for him, and maybe at that transition, if, like you've said, if Z starts to flex some of that muscle internationally a little bit more towards North Korea, it could topple the whole regime. And I hadn't thought about that. Just the opportunity to leave, how many people would leave to China and to uh, to South Korea? And actually, it's interesting you say that. Kim Jong-un made an address addressing or acknowledging that there is an agricultural crisis, or I forget the terminology specifically that he used. It was the end of last month that he discussed this and then a lot of different outfits wrote about it and of course it was toned it was described as we need to rework our agricultural you know strategy but in my mind the fact that the North Korean leader was acknowledging this at all was pretty drastic that I think that indicates that the problem is larger than perhaps we even could have thought previously just because it was making a concession to some kind of weakness. And for the North Korean leader to do that willingly surprised me personally. But um, yeah, I definitely recommend looking into some of that of his address that was made at the end of February, of that there is definitely agricultural problems going on in the country right now. But you're right, the situation d- doesn't look good. And I think a lot of people would probably want to get out of there as soon as possible if the opportunity arose. And we've heard the stories from North Korean defectors of how bad it actually is. And I think we need to start looking at that 
more seriously now, especially. All right. Shameless self-promotion. Where can people follow you, Emily? <laughs> sure. So I have a page with Young Voices. I recommend checking me out there. You can see my upcoming work. I also, you can find my recent article on the diplomat.com, like you mentioned. I'll be publishing more in the upcoming months. You can follow me also on Twitter at, at E-M-S-C-H-R-O-E-N or on LinkedIn to see more of my work. All right. Very good. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your insights and thank you for having me on. And thank you, listener, for tuning in. If you appreciated this, then please share it with your friends. That's the best way to help this podcast grow and to help find information like this that you're not going to hear other places. Thank you so much for listening here on The Chris Spangle Show.